May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. The popular teachings in the world today. I don't know how popular these are in Mumbai, but in the West, these things have become very popular. Somebody's telling you, be in the moment. Somebody's telling you, just let go, everything will be okay. That means there must be somebody taking care of your life from behind, then you can let go. <laughs> Someone telling you, just do one thing at a time, don't... See, these are all regressive teachings in the sense just to explore one or two. What can you let go, tell me? They're saying, just let go, God will do it. Well, life has not really gotten you yet, that's why you're talking this language. You're living in a fanciful world, and life really gets you, then you will know you can't let go anything, you have to manage. You let go your business today and see what will happen. Or try something more dramatic, you're driving today, just let go. <laughs> Lot of people seem to have <laughs> Just let go and see either you're dead or somebody else is dead. Now, these popular teachings which have unfortunately become popular has messed up humanity in a big way. I… I faced a group of people recently in America, where they're staunch be-in-the-moment people. I'm asking you, can you be somewhere else? Be somewhere else and show me, please. Can any of you be anywhere else other than this moment, I'm asking? Can you be? Can you be somewhere else than here, right now? No, then why do you need such a teaching? What they're trying to tell you is, don't think about tomorrow, don't think about yesterday. That will happen if we take away half your brain. If I pull out half your brain, you cannot think about tomorrow, you cannot think about yesterday, just be in the moment. This is all coming, because people do not even know how to sit in one place peacefully, okay? So people are coming up with solutions like this. Shankaran Pillai opened a pharmacy in United States. And one day he had something to attend to, some little chore that he has to attend to. So he asked his teenage son, please take care of the shop just for an hour, I'll be back. So the boy said, no problem, dad. So he went out, in an hour's time he came back. When he came back, in front of the shop, there was a man hugging the lamp, lamp post and his eyeballs were rolling wildly and he was looking totally crazy. He looked at the man, whether the man is wanting to go into the shop or is he going out of the shop, you don't know. So he looked at him and then he went inside and he asked his son, who is that guy hugging the lamppost like that? Is he our customer? The boy said, yes, dad, he's our customer. What did you give him? Oh, he had you whooping cough. So I gave him a box of laxatives and made him take it right here, all of them. I said, what? For whooping cough, you gave him laxatives? Why? Come on, Dad, look at him. Does he dare to cough now? <laughs> <laughs> you 
There are solutions and solutions <laughs> but is it really a solution? That's a question. So now because you can't sit in one place peacefully, somebody says, be in the moment, don't think about the past, don't think about the future. Tell me, can you call yourself a human being if you cannot remember the past and project into the future? Will you be a full-fledged human being, I'm asking? You wanting to go back in the evolutionary scale because you don't know how to handle your own intelligence. This is the biggest problem with the human being. Their only problem is this, you may call it by thousand different names, but the only problem is you do not know how to handle your own intelligence, isn't it? You will see if we take away half your brain, you will be peaceful, yes or no? But I am asking, is that a solution? Is that a solution, taking away half your brain? So taking away your ability to look back into the past and look out into the future, if you take away this ability, maybe you will be peaceful for… but towards what purpose? I know so many people today are going about talking, being peaceful or peace of mind is the ultimate goal of your life. Even the so-called spiritual teachers and leaders are going about saying, peace of mind is the ultimate goal. You tell me from your intelligence. Can you enjoy your dinner tonight? If you're not peaceful, if not joyful, at least peaceful you must be to enjoy the dinner, isn't it? Can you enjoy driving back home if you're not peaceful? Can you enjoy the people around you if you're not peaceful? Can you enjoy the work that you do if you're not peaceful, I'm asking? If you're not able to be joyful or ecstatic, at least you must be peaceful, isn't it? So I'm asking you, is it a fundamental requirement of life or is it the ultimate goal of life? Hmm? It's the most fundamental requirement. But now people are pushing it to heaven, they're saying peace is the ultimate goal of life. Such people will only rest in peace. Anything that you're deprived of tends to become heavenly product. Today if you say peace, people say divine peace. If you say love, people say divine love. If you say bliss, people say divine love, divine bliss. These are all things human beings are capable of, isn't it? To be peaceful, to be joyful, to be loving, to be blissful, these are all human qualities, yes or no? If you're willing, you can be peaceful, you can be loving, you can be blissful. But all these things have been exported to heaven. So, these simple aspects have become complicated because of all these teachings, I'm saying, it doesn't matter where the teaching comes from. Whether it comes from me or somebody else, just keep it aside. Just apply your intelligence. You cannot use my intelligence, okay? You can use my wisdom maybe, but you cannot use my intelligence, you can only use your intelligence. So with your intelligence, experiment. If it works, let's keep it. If it doesn't work, discard it tomorrow morning. No need to continue it for one more day. But first you must decide, are you looking for solace or are you looking for solutions? If you're looking for solace, just believe something, it'll work, you understand? You believe that the source of life is in this light bulb and every day do this, it'll work. What you're doing is just inexpensive psychiatry. Yes, you're trying to manage your psychological space with something, using an anchor outside. It's all right, I'm not saying it's wrong. If, if you need that, you can do it. But if that's not your requirement, what you want is an ultimate solution for life, then you need something else which will not come with these kind of popular teachings. You need a powerful force to move you from one dimension of life to another. So when such a need comes, 
if such a longing comes, then you must look for spirituality, otherwise just… just do something, go climb a mountain, it'll work, I'm telling you, you'll build your confidence, <laughs> yes. Climb a mountain, swim in the ocean, all these things will build your confidence or believe something. But towards what end, what is your requirement is something you have to see. Do you have a longing for the ultimate or are you just trying to manage your psychological drama? That's a first distinction you have to make. But your psychological drama can be managed only from within. You can believe that you're using outside help, but actually you can only manage from within because this is a ghost that you create, you can't kill it from outside. So let go. See the way uh, the question is asked and also the way normally it's addressed is, People think uh, there is something called as negative thought and positive thought. They want to remove the negative thoughts and have only positive thoughts. For such people, I would ask them to just experiment for uh, ten, fifteen seconds. Let them forcefully remove one thought from their mind. For example, next ten seconds, just don't think of a monkey. Try not to think of a monkey for next ten seconds you will see you will be full of monkeys. So what I am saying is, this is the nature of your mind, because in this mind all the three pedals are throttled. There is no brake, there is no clutch, whatever you touch it will only go faster. In this kind of mind, people have been taught from moral teachers and religious teachers, do not think about bad things. Well, since then it's been a full-time job. So there is no way you can handle the mind like this, this doesn't need any great enlightenment. If you spend two minutes with your eyes closed, you will realize you cannot do anything forcefully with this mind. So I want to remove negative thoughts. Do not ever go in this direction because what you want to remove will become your quality, always you will be on it. So what should I do? The thing is this, Without understanding the fundamental mechanism of this mind, because our mind, human mind, is the most sophisticated computer on the planet. Even all the supercomputers have come out of this. When this is the case, is it not important that we understand the mechanics of how it functions? One simplistic aspect of how it functions is, there are no subtractions and divisions in our mind. There is only addition and multiplication. If you try to do something with it, it will say one more. If you try hard, it will multiply into many more. In this mind, you don't try to identify what is positive, what is negative and try to remove it. First of all, one needs to understand this mind of yours, this body of yours is supposed to serve you. The life that you are is important. Body and mind are vehicles that must serve us. If you sit in a vehicle, it must go where you want to go. If it goes to its own destination, what is the point of such a vehicle? It's just a nuisance. Right now, most human beings are unfortunately experiencing this fantastic possibility of human mind as a nuisance, as a troublesome thing. Well, this is the most beautiful thing you have. It's just that you need to pay little attention as to how it functions. One simple thing is this. First and foremost process is that's why we put out this uh, process called Isha Kriya. This Distance yourself from your physiological and psychological process. There is something called as you which exists. This is not a composite of all your thoughts and emotions and physiological processes. Beyond that, there is you. If you close your eyes, even if you cannot see anything, you are still there. It is through the window of your eyes that you are looking out, but if you close your eyes, it doesn't mean that you don't exist, you still exist. So beyond your thought, you still exist. Beyond your emotion, you still exist. So that you, the life that you are, this has to come into your experience. Why is it that you're not allowing that to come into your experience, which is the most significant aspect of who you are? 
who you are right now, the most significant aspect is you and me are alive right now, this is it. What I'm thinking, what you're thinking is not the important thing. We are alive right now, that is the important thing. So, it is important that you focus on this fundamental sense of aliveness within you and then you will see there is a natural distance between you and your thought process. Once there is a distance between your psychological process and your physiological process, this is the end of suffering because there are only two kinds of suffering that human beings go through, physical suffering and mental suffering. Once you create a little space between you and your mind, between you and your body, this is the end of suffering. This is something every human being has to experience and know, otherwise thinking I will just remove negative thoughts and I will have positive thoughts, all the best, it's not going to work one hundred percent, it's not going to work because nobody can remove it, they can avoid it for some time. So when negative thoughts come, you say Ram Ram, Shiva Shiva, whatever you want, but this is just avoiding, it's not gone. The moment you stop that, it will pop back with great force, otherwise it will come back in your dreams. So it's very important, first of all you need to understand your anger, your resentment, your fear, your anxieties, the negativity that you generate, generally resentment, anger, it is always directed towards somebody. But we need to understand this is poisons that we are drinking and expecting somebody else to die. Fortunately, life doesn't work like that. If I drink poison, I die. If I drink poison, you don't die. So, we need to understand this. When I say poison, today you can have yourself chemically analyzed. Right now, what is your blood work, what it says? Five minutes of intense anger, check your blood work and see, there will be lots of negative elements in it, literally you're poisoning yourself. So, do you want to poison yourself? Definitely not. Now the very question is coming from certain helplessness, what shall I do? Don't do anything, just sit back and just concern yourself with something which is a life process. Maybe your heartbeat, maybe your breath, maybe just the sensation of being alive, depending upon how sensitive or how perceptive you are accordingly, find something. It could be a sensation in the body, it could be breath, it could be heartbeat, it could be anything, something which indicates life to you. Just pay attention to that for some time, slowly you will see there is a distinction between what is you and what you have gathered, which includes both your physiological and psychological possibility or mess, whatever you made out of it. Sahasrar is the seventh chakra that is not in the body, just outside the body. For most people, it is dormant, it is not active. If some sadhana comes into your life, if you activate it in a certain way, or because of a very intense way of living, it can become active. If energies move into Sahasrar, you will become unexplainably, unreasonably ecstatic simply like crazy you're ecstatic. If you come to the Bhava Spandana, you will see, simply for no reason, you will be spilling in ecstasy. You just don't know what's happening, just no external reason, simply you're ecstatic, simply because your energies touch Sahasrara. From Mooladhara to Agna, there are many pathways as to how to get there, any number of methods and teachings as to how to reach there. From Agna to Sahasrar, there is no path. If you want to move from Agna to Sahasrar, because there is no path, that is the reason why many people have gone about propagating peace is the highest thing to achieve because they got stuck here. So from Agna to Sahasrar, there is no pathway. This is the fundamental reason why there is so much stress on a guru in the traditions because if you have to jump, suppose there is here a black hole, if you have to just jump into it, you must be utterly crazy or you must have extraordinary kind of courage or you must trust somebody so much 
that if he says jump without any problem, you will jump. Otherwise, there's no possibility, isn't it? Because that possibility is not there for many people, that's the reason why they have concluded peace is the ultimate thing, because they got stuck here, they wouldn't go up. About seeing a form of an eye is simply because certain… certain systems, certain systems of practices made a whole imagery about it. These images were not just drawn on paper, they established forms of it. This is a whole science by itself. In India, this is called as the science of consecration. In the yogic traditions, this science of consecration can be taken to such peaks. Any form you want, you can consecrate it and make it a reality. Right now, let us say I want a fierce dragon established energy-wise. Now, I will es establish a temple for a dragon. And if you go there, you have a deep experience of the dragon because the energy form of the dragon is like alive, like a real thing. Because the science of consecration is such, any form that you want, you can consecrate it and make the energy hold that form. So deities were created for different purposes, whichever kind of form they wanted, they created it. So like this, people created different kinds of imagery for the sake of sadhana, so that people could make use of it. It is not… A, it is not that that's the way you have it, but it has been established in many traditions. Third eye has been elaborately established as an energy form. If you happen to come in touch with this somewhere, you may begin to see it. But these are two different kinds of yoga. There is something called as right hand yoga and left hand yoga. In the right hand yoga, there is no imagery. Right now, what we are offering to you is that, no imagery. We don't use any kind of imagination. Because once you go on imagination, you must be in constant care of somebody who knows what is what, somebody who is capable of taking away the images when it is no more needed. Otherwise, you won't know where is reality and where is imagination. You will just fly off into imaginary states very easily. So here we are using a path of pragna where there is no imagery, no imagery at all. Just use yourself to grow. Maybe it is not as colorful as that, but it's more steady, you don't get lost. You know if you take a step forward, you know it, if you take a step backward, you know it. There you will not know, but it's very colorful and exuberant ways. Uh, we also do that, but not with, you know, large groups of people like this. I also very much do those kind of things, but not with large groups of people because people will fly off into imaginary states so easily. All these things can be quelled from within if only we are willing to pay a certain level of attention to the innermost dimension of who we are. These things can be altered just by bringing about a certain balance in the system, activating a certain level of inner energy. The inner engineering process is just about this, that you find access to this deepest dimension of intelligence and competence within ourselves, which is capable of generating this body, creating this body from what kind of material? If you eat a piece of bread, it turns into human system in a few hours' time. So there is that dimension of intelligence and competence within this. If only you found access to that, health is not even something that you have to struggle with. You know what this is? This is called a Rudraksh, okay? Rudraksh as a seed, this tree mainly grows at certain altitude. Somewhere between 6,500 to 12,000 altitude is where Rudraksh grows in the Himalayan region. And uh, it has very unique vibrations. It uh, brings down the blood pressure in your system, your nerves will be calm. There are various types of Rudraksh, from a single-faced Rudraksh, to twenty-one faces. These are for specific purposes.
For people who are in family and social situations, the best thing to wear is always the fire-faced rudraksh. These are called panchamukhis. A fire-faced rudraksh, if you see, there will be grooves, you can count the faces. Fire-faced rudraksh is the best.
Gautama being her husband at that time and Yashodara with an infant child, Gautama left the house without telling her in the middle of the night like a thief. He did that because he admitted that he did not have the courage to face her. If he looked her in the eye, his determination to go in search of truth may falter. If he looks at his, at his child, when the child is awake and calls him father, his longing to know may falter. So he left in the night. Now he is going back after eight years, a fully enlightened being. But he is sensitive enough to appreciate the emotions of Yashoda, how she would have felt and how she is still angry with what happened to her life. What happened to Gautama's life is fantastic. What happened to Yashoda is not a good thing. He knows that. So he is going there to see what he can offer to her now to compensate for what she has lost in these eight years. So it is a sensitive situation. So he told Ananda, this once relieve me from the promise that I made you. This is not for myself. For me, she is no more my wife, I have grown beyond those things. But for her, I am still her husband who deserted her without telling her, without giving a warning about it. So this is a sensitive emotion for her. She is a proud woman, it is not good for you to be there. Ananda said, you must keep your promise. Gautama bowed down and said, okay. And he took her, took him there also into that situation. When Yeshodara saw that he has come with an assistant monk to face her, she just flew into your age. <laughs> Gautama knew this. He said, this once relieve me of this promise that I made. This is nothing spiritual that you are going to miss anything. This is about my wife. He said, no. Then, towards the end of Gautama's life, Gautama's work created many enlightened beings. But Ananda was still the same man. One service he has done for Aziz, he recorded everything, events that happened according to his understanding. But he recorded everything very diligently. So, people asked, why is he still like this? So many people just came and met you for a moment and they got enlightened. They have transformed themselves in so many ways. But he is always sitting next to you and why is he like this? Gautama just said, a spoon cannot taste the soup. What you refer to as the guru is just a certain energy, a certain possibility. It's not the person. So the physical presence, is it important? It is very important. But the physical need not mean the physical body. The grace is not an airy thing, we can make it very physical. It's as physical as the breeze that you feel, it's as physical as the sunlight. Initially, when a person is just beginning to become receptive, being in the physical presence of the guru becomes very essential because your way of perception is only seeing and hearing and five senses. Because of this, you want to hold him in your eye, you want to hold him in your ears. This is the way you know he's there. 
Yes, it is a necessity in the beginning, but you need not remain there all the time. He will be very physical. You heard of Bernard Shaw? Not heard of Bernard Shaw? The, the drama… the playwright? Okay. A new… a new playwright who wrote a play and directed it, invited Shaw to come and watch his play. Shaw went, sat there, within a few minutes he slept off. When the play was over, the young artist or the young writer came to Shaw and said, I invited you because I wanted your comments, this is my first play. Bernard Shaw looked at him and said, sleep is a comment. So you are not sleeping well or you are sleeping well, it is a commentary on your life. There is another kind of dream which is… Uh, which is not really a dream. Now, uh, there is Bhairavi here. She is a dream, we dreamed her up. You dream it up in such a way that it becomes a reality. Or in other words, this is a dream to establish your consciousness and your energy in a certain way. I was mentioning the other day also, down under in Australia, the Aborigine people, call the time of creation as dream time. Creator dreamed it up. In India, we call this maya or illusion or an illusion can be called a dream, isn't it? It's called dream time. The time of creation is referred to as dream time. We say, Leela, He's playing with, you know, creator is weaving his maya and playing around. The, the words leela and maya describe creation in the most appropriate manner because that's how it is. And the whole science of what we are referring to as tantra is just this, that you dream up something and slowly you bring it into reality. First you create it here and slowly roll it out and it becomes a reality. All deities were made like this. For a particular purpose, they created it here and rolled it out and it's as real as anything. In everybody's experience, not just if it's… if it's true only in your experience, it could still be a dream. When your dream becomes a living experience for everybody, that's reality, isn't it? Not because you're trying to influence them by suggestion, not because you're trying to hypnotize them with a powerful suggestion, you need not know anything. You walk into the Devi temple, it hits you in the face. You don't have to believe anything because now she is reality. But just two, three years ago, she was just a dream. So this dream, now a manifest reality. And all of us happened like that. It's a dream which found a physical expression in a certain way. But without using any material, you can give an expression to a dream. It is not really a dream, this is creation. This is how the whole creation has happened. If you can play with the illusion, 
when I say play with the illusion, suppose I want I can play with a ball, there is no ball, but I start playing. If we do this intensely enough, after some time there will be a ball. Not that we have to get a ball from somewhere. If you do this, actually you can feel something bouncing around. Not just in my experience, whoever comes here, they can feel the ball. So this is creation and that also is rooted in your dream. Because if you cross the boundaries of sanchita, then you are touching the dimension, that which is the source of creation. There if mind can function, usually when you touch it, mind will be so overwhelmed unless it's trained that it just becomes pfft. This probably some people are describing as no mind. You go into a zone or a space where the moment you come in the presence of, a di of an energy which is beyond your understanding, you freeze. This cannot be termed confusion. It's a state where mind will not exist unless it has gone through a certain level of preparedness. So when you come in front of, or let's say in traditional terms, you would say, now you faced God, now your mind is frozen. What a waste, isn't it? <laughs> so much you <laughs> did to get there. When you get there, you're frozen. It's still useful, but if your mind is trained enough, if there is substantial sadhana behind you, when you cross that place where there is no memory, right now your mind exists the way it exists only because there is memory, you understand? When you cross that boundary where the terrain of memory is over, only of perception is there, most minds, I would say 99.999, you can put as many nines as you want, that many, that much percentage of the minds will be frozen if they have no memory to operate. These minds are operating only of existing memory. If memory is taken away, they will not know how to do anything. What you're doing as yoga is to train the mind, train the mind, train the mind to a place where tomorrow if memory falls down, your whole karmic structure just fell down, still you have a mind. Then if your body falls down, that means if you fall dead, you still have a mind. Now you can navigate yourself where you want, otherwise you go by your tendencies. So these are four types of dreams. The last one you cannot really call it a dream. It is… it is… Uh, what to say? It is the other bank. It is not this bank, it is the other bank of existence. So, one thing that I must tell you as advice is, whatever the dream, learn to ignore it. Because if you start looking for meanings in dream, you will lose meaning for your life, you will become hallucinatory. Even without doing any activity, you can still manifest what you want. If you organize these four dimensions in one direction and keep it unwavering in that direction for a certain period of time. Right now the problem with your mind is, every moment it is changing its direction. It is like you want to travel somewhere and every two steps if you keep changing your direction, the question of you reaching the destination is very remote unless it happens by chance. So, organizing our minds and in turn organizing the whole system and these four basic dimensions of who you are right now in one direction, if you do this, you are a kalpavruksha yourself, anything that you wish will happen. But right now, if you look at your lives, everything that you have wished for till now, if it happens, you have finished. Everything and everybody that you have desired for, if all of that lands up in your house today, could you live with that? Once we're empowered like this, it's very important that our physical action 
emotional action, mental action and energy actions are controlled and properly directed. If it is not so, we become destructive, self-destructive. Right now, that is our problem. The technology which is supposed to make our life beautiful and easy has become the source of all the problem that we are destroying the very basis of our life which is the planet. So what should have been a boon, we are making a curse out of it. What has brought incredible levels of comfort and convenience to us in the last hundred years or so has also become a threat to our life simply because we are not conscious action, we are in a compulsive state of action. So organizing our minds fundamentally means moving from a compulsive state of activity to a conscious state of activity. You might have heard of people for whom they asked for something and beyond all expectations it came true to the, true for them. Generally this happens to people who are in faith. Now, let's say you want to build a house. If you start thinking, oh I want to build a house, to build a house I need fifty lakhs but I have only fifty rupees in my pocket, not possible, not possible, not possible. The moment you say not possible, you are also saying I don't want it. So on one level, you're creating a desire that you want something. On another level, you're saying, I don't want it. So in this conflict, it may not happen. Someone who has some faith in a god or in a temple or whatever, who is simple-minded, faith works only for those people who are simple-minded. Thinking people, people who are too much thinking, for them it never works. A childlike person who has a simple faith, in his god or his temple or whatever. He goes to the temple and says, Shiva, I want a house. I don't know how, you must make it for me. Now in his mind, there are no negative thoughts. Will it happen? Will it not happen? Is it possible? Is it not possible? These things are completely removed by this simple act of faith. Now he believes Shiva will do it for him and it will happen. So is Shiva going to come and build your house? No, I want you to understand, God will not lift his little finger for you. What you refer to as God is the source of creation. As a creator, he has done a phenomenal job, there's no question about it. Could you think of a better creation than this? Is it in anybody's imagination to think anything better than what is there right now? So as a creator, he has done his job wonderfully well, but if you want life to happen the way you want it, because right now the very crux of your happiness and your well-being is this, if at all if you're unhappy, <laughs> the only and only reason why you're unhappy is life is not happening the way you think it should happen. That's all it is. So if life is not happening the way you think it is, it should happen, you're unhappy. If life happens the way you think it should happen, you're happy. It's as simple as that. So if life has to happen the way you think it should happen, first of all, how you think, with how much focus you think, how much stability is there in your thought and how much reverberance is there in the thought process will determine whether your thought will become a reality or is it just an empty thought. Or how, how you do not create any impediments for your thought, by creating negative thought process. This possible, is something possible or not possible? Is destroying humanity. What is possible and not possible is not your business, it's nature's business. Your business is just to strive for what you want. Right now you're sitting here, if I ask you two simple questions, I want you to just look at this and answer this. Right now, from where you're sitting, can you just fly off? You say no. Right now, from where you're sitting, can you get up and walk? You'll say yes. What is the basis of this? Why you say no to flying and yes to walking? Because past experience of life, many times you've gotten up and walked, never did you fly off. Or in other words, you're using the past experience of life as a basis for deciding whether something is possible or not possible. Or in other words, you have decided 
that what has not happened till now cannot happen in your life in future. This is a disgrace to humanity and the human spirit. What has not happened till now on this planet can happen tomorrow. Human beings are capable of making it happen tomorrow. So what is possible and what is not possible is not your business. That is nature's business, nature will decide that. You just see what is it that you really want and strive for that. And if your thought is created in a powerful way, without any negativity, without any negative thoughts, bringing down the intensity of the thought process. The first and foremost thing is, you must be clear what is it that you really want. If you do not know what you want, the question of creating it doesn't arise. If you look at what you really want, what every human being wants is, he wants to live joyfully, he wants to live peacefully, in terms of its relationships, he wants it to be loving and affectionate. Or in other words, all that any human being is seeking for is pleasantness within himself, pleasantness around him. This pleasantness, if it happens in our body, we call this health and pleasure. If it happens in our mind, we call this peace and joy. If it happens in our emotion, we call this love and compassion. If it happens in our energy, we call this blissfulness and ecstasy. This is all that a human being is looking for. Whether he is going to his office to work, he wants to make money, build a career, build a family, he sits in the bar, sits in the temple, he is still looking for the same thing – pleasantness within, pleasantness around. If this is what we want to create, I think it's time we addressed it directly and commit ourselves to creating it. So you want to create yourself. In United States of America, there is a segment of people who believe that next time when Jesus comes, he will come in United States. Generally, it's believed he will come in Mount Olive in Jerusalem, but now US people are saying, why will he go to Israel? That's not a good place to go. He will come in United States. So they asked me a question like this in a large gathering, Sadhguru, what do you think? Jesus will come in United States or in Jerusalem? I said, see, last time he came in Jerusalem and he said, come follow me. Only twelve people, hmm? Today you are celebrating him as a great being, but only twelve people followed him. In that one of them freaked on him. All right? But if he comes to United States today, if he says, come follow me, you have a bank loan, student loan, car loan, house loan, holiday home loan, you are mortgage for forty-five years. <laughs> if Jesus says, come follow me, nobody will be there because everybody has to go to the bank. So you have entangled yourself in such a way even if the most significant things happen, you can't change the direction of your life. Hello? If the greatest things came your way, you cannot change the direction of your life. This is a slave's life, isn't it? What is slavery? He cannot choose. That is slavery, isn't it? Now, you are making that kind of arrangements in your life, you cannot choose, you're stuck in your own arrangements. A spider whips a web for other things to be caught. But if you are that kind of a spider, you build a web in which you are caught, you are a stupid spider, isn't it? And most human beings are in that condition. <laughs> if something significant happens here, you are going this way, if something really significant happened this way, you can go this way. Your arrangements will not trap you. This is an intelligent life. If you are smart enough, you will make arrangements that support you, not arrangements that entangle you, isn't it? Jesus is not a good man. Maybe he's wonderful, but not a good man. If you don't let that man rise within you, then you will remain good and dead. That part of you which has been kept dead for too long, it's time to raise it. Whatever we are referring to as Jesus is not about some man two thousand years ago. It's about a certain possibility within every human being. So that has to rise.
It's not that there is no Jesus in you, it's just you kept him hung, impotent. He needs little empowerment, he needs to be raised. So the whole effort is that part of you which we can call Jesus or Shiva or whatever you like, to allow that to rise. Can you say Shiva is a good man? No, but he's fantastic. Even Jesus, not a good man, wonderful, not a good man. Anybody who disturbs the existing situation is not a good man, isn't it? Yes or no? In any given situation, someone who disturbs your family situation, somebody who disturbs your social situation or political situation, national or international situation, is not a good man in that society, isn't it so? So Jesus is not a good man. Maybe he's wonderful but not a good man. Shiva definitely not a good man, but fantastic he is. If you don't let, let that man rise within you, if you do not let that aspect rise within you, then you will remain good and dead. Dead is good. Dead is always good. Yes or no? Once it happened, a five-year-old boy and his mother went to the cemetery. He had never seen a cemetery in his life, this is the first time. The mother was dedicated to one particular grave, she sat down. The boy went about everywhere, reading all the inscriptions on the tombstones. He went through the whole cemetery, read everything and came back to his mother and asked his mother, Mom, where do they bury all the horrible people? Every tombstone says this was the most wonderful man. Dead is always good, isn't it? Dead is good, living is trouble. <laughs> because living is trouble, we reduce the living to half dead. Fifty percent life is safe. That's where most people have settled. We must decide, dead or alive. Half dead is not good, isn't it? Once Shankaran Pillai was arrested for mixing horse meat in chicken cutlets and selling. So when he went uh, to the court, there was nothing else to do, so he pleaded guilty. And they asked, how much horse meat and chicken meat, how did you do? He said, fifty-fifty I did. So he got some fine and some kind of thing and then he came out. His friend asked him, what did you mean by saying fifty-fifty? He said, one horse, one chicken <laughs> That's fifty-fifty <laughs> So, this mixture won't work. You have to raise the dead. You really have to raise the dead that part of you which has been kept dead for too long, it's time to raise it. And they have no problem, they'll never fight about it <laughs> because it's a land of seeking. So, first mistake you make is you believe what I say. I am constantly reminding you, don't believe a goddamn thing that anybody says, but don't be foolish enough to disbelieve it either. All you have to do is Experiment with it, does it work or doesn't work? If it works, you keep it, otherwise rubbish it, what's the problem? Now, about somebody being hungry, somebody being homeless, somebody being in a war zone, all kinds of horrible things are happening on the planet. I am not ignorant of it, anyway you said living in a temple, I am not living in a temple, I am more of the world than you are every day. <laughs> I want you to understand, I am running a volunteer organization with over four thousand full-time volunteers and over three million part-time volunteers doing variety of work, huge projects, over a dozen businesses and the spiritual movement, okay? Now, 
I want you to understand, more things are going wrong with my life on a daily basis than anybody's <laughs> life. Now, when a man is hungry, if you try to tell him, your intellect is the source of your problem, <laughs> it's obscene. It's obscene, it's nothing short of that. I never spoke to hungry people and said, your intellect is the source of the problem. I'm talking to people who are bulging <laughs> in so many ways. In their head and in their body, they're bulging. I'm only talking to that segment of the population. Those who are not fe fed well, I'm doing social projects with them, with nourishment, education, health, all for free. Will I ever go and talk to a starved man in an Indian village and tell him, your intellect is the basis of all your problems? <laughs> what makes you think that I'm that stupid? <laughs> uh, do I look like that? <laughs> so you also don't do that. This is for you. You need to understand this, there are million problems on the planet. All these million problems are essentially because those who are reasonably well have never cared to reach out and do what needs to be done in the world. In many ways, they're making sure those people don't get it. <laughs> yes. In the year 2012, we have produced enough food for 18.2 billion people. We had only 6.6 .6 billion people in that year, but still, Fifty percent of the population is malnourished and hardly eaten anything. This is not because there is no food, because this is because you and me have not cared, isn't it? So, is it true, is it true nobody stabbed you in the last twenty-five years? Yes. But is it also true you are suffering various things of tension, stress, anxiety, this, that? Is it a product of your mind or somebody else poking you from outside? It is your reaction to the existential situation outside. Instead of doing what is needed, what you see is when you see something wrong happening or when you see some suffering or something comes your way, you decide to poke yourself. This is about incapacitating yourself. Instead of seeing when there is a problem, you need empowerment, not incapacitating yourself, isn't it? I'm talking about empowering you so that your damn intelligence functions for you, not against you. The moment your intelligence is working against you, no god in the universe is going to help you and can help you. Yes, if your intelligence has turned against you, you are a finished case. So I'm saying, first let your intelligence work for you. If it works for you, there are many miraculous things that you can do for all those people who have still not eaten properly, for whom basic things have not been taken care of. I think a sabbatical <laughs> is good <laughs> He may come up with something that you've not thought possible <laughs> I will… I will convey your message, Jai Sadhguru. I'm sure he's watching this program <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, I believe that talent is something which is grossly exaggerated in success. It's… when I was in medical school, I used to teach martial art. Uh, that was my passion <laughs> and uh, every time a… Bruce Lee's movie was released, all these school kids would come and join in hordes to martial arts schools. We used to call it Bruce Lee They're phenomenon. after two weeks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I used to see some kids whose physique is meant for martial art, who have the natural flair, and I used to think, oh, this kid is going to get a black belt. And interestingly, Swamiji, mm -hmm. after six months, they're never there. The guys who go up to the black belt and, you know, do something very good in martial art are the ones who 
joined the school without any skills, without any talent, who worked very, very hard for everything they had to sweat it out. But in the end, they are the ones who succeed. How do you explain this phenomenon? <clears throat> See, uh, for a variety of reasons, let me not go beyond this. For a variety of reasons, a certain individual could be born with a certain flair, physical flair, mental flair, emotional flair, style. You know, five-year-old child, one has style, other is clumsy, okay? <laughs> so the one with the style is not going to become necessarily a fashion thing. Somebody else who seems to be clumsy may grow into something else. Like, uh, you don't know when a woman is pregnant, the child within that womb, whether it's a sage or a sorcerer, not the woman know. No, the mother does not know whether she is producing a sage or a sorcerer or what. This is because I use the word coherence because of modern science is using that word. Who you are here right now, as you sit here, this is physics. Every subatomic particle is in constant contact with everything. What you call as cosmos is living life and it's a live mind. You have captured only one small part of it. If you work with only that one smart, small part of what you have captured, both as life and as intelligence, you will function at a certain level. If you apply yourself to break the barriers of your limitations that you've set for yourself, then there is an intelligence beyond anybody's understanding beyond anybody's estimate, which is available to you. Once this is available to you, people think you're superhuman. No, this is not about being superhuman. This is about realizing that being human is super. The immensity of being human has not been realized. So we are always making a a kind of a mathematical calculation. Okay, if this person has this much IQ, maybe this is what he will become. This is what Newton's law, that everything that moves on this planet works to a mathematical precision or a geometric precision. That is, if you take a pendulum, the length of the pendulum will decide how it will swing. If you take a projectile, depending upon its mass, velocity and uh, the, uh, the trajectory, it will go to a certain place. That is not how the cosmos is working because what you think is physical and not physical is all mixed up within this, within this human being. The physical self, the psychological self, the emotional self and who you call as myself, the life within you, the fundamental life process, these are all different dimensions and the innermost core of who you are which because all the other words are corrupted, I'll use the word life or just you, what you call as me. This, if you allow it, if you do not identify it with any form, with your physical form or with other different identities that you take on, it has a, a way of being cohesive or collaborative with everything around. When we say somebody worked hard, all he is trying to do is stretch his boundary of identity, isn't it? He's trying to stretch his boundary. If he succeeds to set, stretch his boundary, something that was… he never thought possible or imagined that is within his competence or capability becomes his. Miraculously, I can show you hundreds of people who come to me, we prepare them for a certain period and then we initiate them. In twenty-four hours, you will see the shape of their face will change. Genetics are altered in twenty-four hours' time. You can see the photographic images, they have actually changed dramatically overnight simply because of a certain extension of their identity. So, in the Indian spiritual milieu, see when you say spiritual, we must understand this. This is not about looking up or looking down. When we say spiritual, we are talking about transcending the limitations of physical. So right now, the physical is here as if it's a solid entity in people's experience. But modern physics is telling you and medical science is beginning to telling, tell you, or if people don't understand, if they just hold their nose for two minutes, they understand that they are not an independent existence. It is in transaction, not just in terms of breath, 
Even on the level of subatomic particles, it's in constant transaction. If this transaction becomes even minutely conscious, suddenly you have immense capabilities that you never thought were possible. Biological identity is the most limiting identity that you have because it limits to the area of your body. Now when you strive, you break this. It doesn't matter in what way you strive. Most people strive in unconscious, unscientific, simply out of striving, they do things. But there are ways to strive scientifically in a proper way. There are tools to strive with specific direction to break the limitations of who we are. If you break this boundary, the subatomic particles are transacting, the intelligence is transacting, only you're missing the whole game. If you don't miss the game, if you are in the game of life, not in the game of thoughts and emotions, you are in the game of life, suddenly just about anything you want you can do, not this or that. I'm saying anything can a human being can do, simply if he breaks his barriers. And these barriers are many levels, but the most fundamental thing is the identity. <laughs> but otherwise in every cell in the body there is air. So when you say air, it's not just the breath. Six percent air is in every cell in the body. Just remove it a little bit from the brain, it'll be good. It's good if it's in the lungs, in the heart, and the muscles. They function better if there is oxygen, you know? You know this, if you're oxygen deprived, muscles become rigid because this needs air, otherwise it'll not work. So. Water is seventy-two percent. <laughs> so maximum care should be taken about the water because it's seventy-two percent. If you are going to an examination, suppose uh, it is like this, let's say you're going for physics examination. You have water, earth, this, that. But just the water subject is for seventy-two marks. Naturally you spend more time reading about water, isn't it? Studying water, yes or no? Air is only six percent. You may not study because you are okay with ninety-four. Water you must study because it's seventy-two percent. You must take enormous care about the water because it's seventy-two percent and it has tremendous memory. If I open this water, even without opening, if I say something to this water, it remembers. There has been lot of experiments in this direction. So, uh, if you take this water from wherever the water works is and pump it to your house, let's say it went through fifty bends, forced pumped forcefully with a certain force, which naturally is done, and you are living on twelfth floor of the apartment, so further forced up. Now they are saying, if it goes through fifty bends, about sixty percent of the water has turned poisonous. Immediately when it comes in the tap, if you take it and immediately drink it, it will work as poison in your system. If you take it and hold it for some time, it will undo itself again. Because the poisoning is not chemical, it is molecular. Molecular changes are happening, no chemical change is happening. This is why traditionally your grandmother always told you, always you must gather the water, keep it overnight in your house, in a properly cleaned vessel with vibhuti and kunkum on it and one flower on it. Yes or no? In traditional homes? Only tomorrow morning you drink it, not as soon as it comes inside your house, you don't drink it because it carries all kinds of memories. In very traditional homes, people every day do puja to the water pot, yes? And you never drink the water as soon as it comes, you keep it, give it enough time to undo itself from whatever nonsense it has gathered, so that it is suitable for you when you drink it. Water you must take care because it's seventy-two percent. 
It's more… it's first class, you know, more than passing mark. Next thing is food, because that's the earth, twelve percent, still substantial, isn't it? So how food goes into you, from whose hands it comes to you, how you eat it, how you approach it, all these things are important. Then comes your air, six percent. In that six percent, only one percent or less is your breath. Rest is happening in so many other ways. And it's important, especially if you have children, at least once a month, take them out somewhere, not to the damn cinema, again breathing everybody's nonsense. <laughs> the air gets affected just by the sounds and the intentions and the emotions, all the rubbish that's happening on the screen and all the rubbish that's reflecting in human minds of violence, of sex, of greed, of this and that, is affecting that limited air in that hall in a tremendous way. So instead of taking them to the cinema, take them to the river, teach them how to swim, climb a mountain, where is mountain Sadhguru? Himalayas is so far away. <laughs> Even a small hill is a mountain for your boy. Yes? Even a little rock, just go climb and sit on one of them, Children will enjoy it immensely, they will become fit, you will become fit. And above all, your body and mind will function differently. And above all, you are in touch with the Creator's creation, which is the most important thing. Not your own rubbish that you made, yes it's comfortable right now, but it's not everything. So instead of going to the restaurant, instead of going to the cinema, instead of going somewhere else like that, at least once a month, it doesn't cost anything. Huh? Doesn't cost anything. You can take your rice and aukai and go and eat there. <laughs> anyway you have it. You don't have to spend money on this. Even better, if you don't want to spend money even on the bus or car, all of you cycle just three kilometers, five kilometers outside, Hyderabad, sit on one rock, just spend time there, feel the sun, it's very important you get some sun, air, good water. Come back, you are doing Bhuta Shuddhi in a very natural way. It is not the ultimate type of Bhuta Shuddhi, but you are doing some Bhuta Shuddhi. This is what I was saying just now, if you take care of food, water, air is not always in your hands because you're living in a city, but water and food you can take care. And what kind of fire burns within you, that also you can take care. Sunlight has not become impure, isn't it? Get some sunlight every day, please. Get some sun on your body every day because sunlight is still pure, isn't it? Nobody can fortunately contaminate it. And what kind of fire burns within you? Is it the fire of greed? Fire of hatred, fire of resentment, fire of anger, fire of love, fire of compassion. What kind of fire burns within you? You take care of that, then you don't worry about your physical and mental well-being, it's taken care of. This is a, a release of prarabdha. This could have some meaning in the sense, if you… you don't have to observe the images of the dream, you have to observe the residue of the dream. Depending upon how the dream has worked out, is it just working out of your latent desires or is some other memory playing a role in making this happen? You don't go about looking at the imagery. Imagery is not important, but the residue it leaves, leaves on the body. When you wake up in the mor morning, how do you feel? If you… see this is the reason why those who closely watching their life avoid all intoxicants and stimulants. If you're pumping in intoxicants and stimulants, you cannot notice anything. Every day, 
feels… early morning feels like hell anyway. They have to work themselves out of it. So once you play with the nervous system, all this is jumbled up, this is not even relevant for such people. Once there are intoxicants and stimulants, it just won't work because your nervous system starts saying something else which is of a completely different nature. The prarabdha, the second type of dream that we talked about, could indicate many things if one is able to watch it. Especially if something is concerned with your health or the possibility of destruction or damage to your body, prarabdha is a good place to watch. I never ever talk about dreams because there are a whole bunch of people who will go crazy imagining all kinds of things on a daily basis. I saw this in my dream, so this is going to happen today, tomorrow that's going to happen. Their imagination will run wild. Dreams will not happen in the night, throughout the day it will start happening. So the third layer of dream is the… if you touch certain states of experience in your life, we could actually do a survey on this. Many of you might have found after you went through a powerful experience, let's say you were initiated into Shambhavi or you went through a Bhava Spandana or you went through a Samyama program or you went through some other initiation process, the dream patterns seem to have changed after that. The type of dreams that you're getting has changed, the volume of dreams could have changed, it could have become more or less or something else. Some change could have happened after a powerful experience. What is the meaning of a powerful experience? A powerful experience means somehow you cross some kind of threshold within you. There are layers and layers of boundaries that one has set up within himself. On a particular day you broke through one or you crossed one layer of something, so the pattern of dream could change. So what was not in play, that memory bank which was not in play, has begun to come into play, new release. <laughs> I don't know if you understand. In India every Friday they say new release, that means a new cinema is coming. So this is a new release. This can of worms were never there, suddenly new release because a powerful experience happened and broke through a certain barrier of memory. These barriers are your protection because if all of it opens up at once, no mind can handle it, it'll just break. So this is called this storehouse of memory or storehouse of karmic substance is called sanchita. This means this is a warehouse of memory. If all of it comes, nobody will be able to handle. So, something from that entered your life. That means this life has become a larger scope than what it was before. Your life was playing out to a certain volume of memory. Now if you break through with a big experience, it has become a larger scope. Larger scope means if you handle it efficiently, larger scope is a great thing. If you handle it inefficiently, larger scope is lot of trouble. And in fact, that is all human beings are struggling with, that human life has a larger scope than other creatures. That is the problem, isn't it? If you were like any other creature, you could eat and sleep and be fine. Because it has a larger scope, that is the trouble that they're suffering. So, 
when a larger scope opens up, then if you handle it right, it'll be very wonderful. If you don't, it'll be painful. But even if it's painful, in the ultimate scheme of things, it's still good for you. You don't like that. <laughs> now, Hatha yoga is painful, isn't it? Yoga is painful, come on, let's admit it. It is painful, but we still do it because in the larger scheme of things, it's good for us. In some way we understand that, that's why we're doing it, isn't it? So, opening up of new… new areas of memory within you can be very painful because now you're putting your life on a fast forward. What should have been handled, probably in a next edition, you're trying to handle it in this edition because you're in a little bit of a rush. You don't want to have one more edition. You want to say everything you want to say in this edition. Now it becomes more complex, isn't it? But if you handle it right, it is very good. Otherwise, it suddenly feels like after entering the spiritual path, everything in the whole universe seems to be kicking you up from every direction because that's how it is. Because you opened up another dimension which you are not handling. I don't know how it is, where you come from, but in India there is something called as tenth standard, which is a board exam. <laughs> Not much stuff in this class, very minimal, but still this is a… <laughs> this is a place where children are terrified usually because the examiners are not their own teachers, somebody else is going to correct their paper. So it all depends how you've been passing till then. Most of them are terrified and uh, <laughs> anti-diarial tablets will sell in millions on that day when the examination comes and all kinds of stuff. This is only a kind of a preparing the child, kind of a rehearse for really graduation for the high school which comes at twelfth standard. If you pass tenth standard, which is supposed to be one milestone in the education process, you don't get into your better place. Suddenly eleventh and twelfth is in a different dimension of study. Till then it was just this. Suddenly eleventh and twelfth is completely it is everything is multiplying at least four times over in terms of syllabi and complexity and everything that you require to study. So passing is not always a good thing. <laughs> but if you don't pass, you don't go to the next step. If you remain in the stay same step, you will suffer stagnation. If you move to the next step, you suffer a larger… a larger challenge that is bound to be there. So this is just like that. If you remain in the same place, it seems to be… life seems to be comfortable. If you move to the next step, it is definitely next step, but it is a much larger challenge to handle. So in terms of dreams, it finds expression in a completely different way. Once sanchita begins to find expression in your dream, it will become completely, absolutely, meaningless dreams. One spot here, one spot there, one this, one that, one that, nothing will be continuous. It will start happening wild dreams without any meaning. You cannot ascribe any kind of meaning to it. This happened. My question is, what means focus to you in, and which way can we apply focus in our daily life? So what's your definition of focus? Okay. Uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference. There is… there are nuances to it, but 
when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I'm talking about, attention not even about something, just being attentive because only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist, all that's happened is there is no attention, because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. 